U.S. gunships were the aircraft most feared by our troops. They called them Dark Death. Other aircraft came in, made a quick strike, and then were gone. The gunships lingered over the battlefield, and when they sighted a target, the cannons released sustained destruction that the North Vietnamese ground crews had never seen. One of the pilots was a man named Don Fraker. He, he noted that one two-minute orbit by an AC-119 could cover every square inch of an area the size of a football field with gunfire. Fraker was well aware of the human toll that took and that weighed heavily on him. Roots of the Shadows and Singers go back to Sherman Fairchild. He was born in 1896 and founded over 70 companies, including Fairchild Aircraft, which made significant contributions to aviation and aerial photography. He was a 1979 inductee into the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Among the other, many other aircraft, Fairchild Aviation bought the, built a C-82 packet, designed to replace pre-World War II transport aircraft such as the Douglas C-47. The next generation C-82 was redesigned with bigger engines. The cockpit was moved forward towards the nose. First flown in 1947 became the C-119 flying boxcar. There's no evidence anyone ever thought these freight haulers would become armed combat aircraft over Southeast Asia. Over 1,100 of these things were built, including 71 in Kaiser Fraser and Willow Run, and you can see Fraser from Kaiser Fraser over the old Willow Run bottom plant. In 1953, the Air Force canceled the contract with Kaiser Fraser. There was some dispute about cost overruns, and I think the whole story is probably lost in history. At least eight of the Kaiser Fraser C-119 mutants were reconfigured for Vietnam service based on review of serial numbers. And a side note, both aircraft appeared in film. C-82s were in the, was in the 1965 flight of the Phoenix Jimmy Stewart. Sir? The C-82. Yep, that was the one. And there was a 2004 remake with Dennis Quay that used the C-119. Based on an Ellison Trevor novel, a survival film after an aircraft crashes in the desert, the survivors cobble together something they could fly. In, a, in addition to traditional air cargo roles, C 119s have unique assignments. Boxcars brought prefabricated bridge components, which weighed almost 2,500 pounds each, to assist the Marines fighting their way out of North Korea's Chosan Reservoir in November 1950. It's essential to the Marines' survival and avoiding annihilation by the Chinese. In Southeast Asia, the Civil Air Transport, or CAP, was a CIA operation, the uh, predecessor to Air America. CAP took C 119s, repainted them in French Air Force livery, and flew them with U.S. pilots. And they dropped supplies and French paratroopers at the MBN Food in 1954. Mm -hmm. Two of those pilots, James McGovern and Wallace Buford, were shot down and killed, becoming two of the first Americans killed during in what became the Vietnam War. Neither of these men's names appear in the Vietnam Wall in D.C., which reports casualties from 1959 forward. Both of these men were posthumously awarded the French Legion of Honor by President Jacques Chirac of France in 2005. They became part of our 1950s and 60s espionage efforts against the Soviet Union and China. One example, there's a number of these programs, but one was called Project Corona. C-119s and then C-130s were three capsules brought by a satellite from outer space with photos of Soviet and Chinese military installations. Huge success for us, we got tons and tons and tons of information. The retrieval process was kind of this Rube Goldberg Act. We used hooks and wires to catch the descending capsule mid-air at about 10,000 feet altitude, and the capsule falling at about 1,600 feet per minute. And the first retrieval aircraft is on display at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. 1962, 119s ferried U.S. troops to Florida for a potential invasion of Cuba in October of that year in response to the missile crisis. A B-52 commander of McCoy Air Force Base in Florida recalled waves of C-119 aircraft low with paratroopers landing for a potential Cuban invasion. Presumably, the C-119s would have gone ahead and been deployed if we actually invaded Cuba. Of course, if that happened, we wouldn't be here today. In terms of gunship development, the concept goes back years in military history. Lieutenant Fred Nelson's on the right, uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Gilmore McDonald on the left. They tried in the 1920s and 1940s to have a, the idea of a gunship and just no luck. The theory was aircraft flying a level turn around a point on the ground as a tether to a pylon can deliver accurate.
accurate firepower from guns perpendicular to the line of flight. Two key figures in the story are Captain Ron Terry and Lieutenant Edwin Sasaki. Terry's on the left, he's an Air Force, he was an Air Force pilot, inspected all aspects of air operations in Vietnam as part of the Air Force Systems Command Team. Sasaki flew 36 missions on C-47s designing and evaluating gunships. He had earlier worked in Gemini 4 technology with NASA. Photos show Sasaki in his later career in higher education. So in the early 60s, the Viet Cong were regularly attacking U.S. Special Forces outposts, outposts in Vietnamese hamlets at night to avoid air counterattacks. U.S. flare ships would effectively illuminate areas surrounding hamlets, thus protecting against night assaults. That led to Terry and Sasaki briefing General Curtis LeMay, who was Air Force Chief of Staff at the time, about gunships. LeMay approved further tests in Vietnam. Almost all of his staff was opposed to uh, the idea. Curtis LeMay, whatever his strengths and weaknesses, was never afraid of unconventional thinking. And Terry and Sasaki thus became a small number of a small handful of people in military history who helped create a totally new weapon then tested it in combat. So Gunship 1 is the AC-47, and as it turns out, the airports had four variants of gunships in Vietnam. Gunship 1 was an AC-47, which was based on the civilian Douglas DC-3. Generally known as Spooky or Puff the Magic Dragon, they served well. Some were lost in enemy action. We needed aircraft that could carry more firepower. Let's go to Gunship 2. Excuse me, AC-130, based on the Lockheed C-130. This was generally known as Spectre. Still in use in different variants as an air gunship in the Air Force. While they were effective, C-130s were needed elsewhere. So between the aging AC-47s and the high demand for AC-130s, there was a need for an additional gunship setting the stage for AC-119s. And it just so happened that C-119s were rarely available in storage or in reserve units and not much wanted by anyone else. Recycling C-119s was approved by the Secretary of the Air Force at the time, Harold Brown. Brown won a, earned a PhD in physics from Columbia at age 21, so obviously a pretty smart, smart guy here. Later went on to serve as President Carter's Secretary of Defense. Air Force leadership in Southeast Asia had no particular interest in this idea. C-119s present any aircraft would present an additional logistics issue of getting parts and maintenance and trained personnel out there. And they had a not great reputation for mechanical problems such as landing gear and engine mount failures. However, their high wind configuration and uh, clear line sight across the fuselage was a big selling point. You can see for yourself some of the key specs on the left of the uh, slide. So, Brown Awards uh, Fairchild Hiller contracted to modify 26 aircraft AC 119Gs by adding 4 7.62 millimeter gallon guns. Further modifications for AC 119Ks include adding two 20 millimeter cannon and two jet assisted engines boosting thrust and carrying capacity. And we have examples courtesy of. Uh, Captain Morgan of both types of uh, the ammunition. And a 20 millimeter truly frightening looking piece of ammo there. Once mod modified, it was a long multi stop trip from the US to Vietnam and it began arriving in the country to December 1968. So when the AC 119th began their work in the war, here's where we were with the war effort. The Tet Offensive in late January 1968 was a turning point in reduced public support for the war. It was a U.S. military victory, which what was not portrayed as such as here at home. U.S. troop presence peaked at 543,000 men and women in April 1969, and then we slowly started drawing down the troop levels. President Nixon announced the Vietnamization of the war in November 1969. The goal was to give South Vietnam a chance at independence from the North. Now, saving South Vietnam may not have been high on the priority list of our airmen, but they did a superb job at a constant risk of being killed, wounded, or captured. First group over was to Vietnam was the 71st Tactical Airlift Squadron. This was a reserve unit based in Columbus, Indiana. They were activated in May 1968. The 71st was one of the best prepared and trained C-119 units here stateside, so they got the call. 
training was held at Lock Warren Air Force Base in Ohio somewhere in fall of 1964. One of the reserves was this guy, James Alvis. He recalled joining the reserves in 1964 and he had personally little interest in traveling to Vietnam for a tour of duty. Word gets out, he worked aircraft maintenance. Word gets out that his guardian was being called up. His exact words were panic and disbelief set in for this, this news. C 119G began, uh, the Sunday first began arriving in Vietnam in December 1968, and they were known as Shadows. First combat mission was flown January 1969. The pilot was Lieutenant Colonel Harold Mitchell. He flew the first Corona mission and successfully retrieved the photo capsule in mid air in 1960. So, a very distinguished career in aviation. In June of 69, the 71st returned to the U.S., leaving some of its aircraft and about two thirds of its personnel in Vietnam to fill out a new gunship, gunship squadron designated the 17th SOS. So, a uh, reunion at the airport coming home. This is Sergeant Floyd Deaton. I assume that's his son on the left. Doesn't seem too thrilled to see his old man, but whatever the family dynamic is, Sergeant Deaton made it home. The 18th SOS flew AC 119Ks of Stingers, as you can see here. So, some of the missions. 1969 alone, the Jeeps flew 3,700 sorties, 14,000 combat hours. 35 million rounds of ammo expended, and no friendly outposts were overrun when covered by these aircraft. Even though the war was supposed to be winding down, it sure didn't seem that way. This, by the way, is a firing circle. So when you have an aircraft in orbit around a central point and it's firing, this is a nighttime image of what the uh, fire, firing output looks like. These guys flew day and night in close support of troops in contact situations to help the guys on the ground. They typically used every drop of fuel on board that they could to maintain as much presence as they could over our troops and protecting them against enemy forces. They applied armed reconnaissance and interdiction of hostile areas and infiltration groups. Search and rescue, they supported uh, search and rescue and medevac missions. It was night armed escort that rode in offshore convoys, illumination for night fighter strikes. There are no missions that, that have come across targeting North Vietnam specifically. They were very active over loss in Cambodia. You know, all I can say is you take a look at that, you do not want to be done to the end of that kind of firepower. President Nixon authorized secret bombing and air missions over Cambodia in March of 69. You can see Cambodia, South Vietnam, the north, and we said Phong Nga, that's, that's Laos. These Cambodian missions, since we had no business being there, at least according to what we were telling the American people, required fake flight plans and mission reports showing attacks over South Vietnam and not the actual mission over in Cambodia. Whatever the location, ground forces appreciated the work of the AC-119s. In one instance, a special forces commander on the ground when advice of phantoms coming to assist shouting to his radio, screw the F-4s, give me a shadow. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, you can see the lots of parts of it illustrated was an essential resupply route used by the North, passing through the country that was alternately mountains, triple canopy, uh, jungle, and grassland. The trail was a constant U.S. target. Stingers would have more sophisticated electronics were put to work. On one estimate, there were five main roads, 29 branch roads, and many cutoffs and bypasses, so about 12,000 miles of trail altogether. And whatever the action, the Air Force aggressively used technology to take the fight to the enemy. And this is late 1960s, so it's long before we had all the fancy computer electronics that we do today. The NAS, the night operation site, uh, amplified whatever light exists on a night mission. Both the operator and the device itself were known as the NAS, night operation, uh, night observation. The FLIR was a forward-looking infrared sensor, set in the aircraft's nose, picked up warmth from the ground, could be troops, could be a water buffalo, and night would be hard to tell. The fire control computer, I'm sure your cell phones have exponentially more power than this device, but that's the technology we had. And with the, it was used as the aircraft pointing in one direction when it's flying in the orbit, guns in another. So it really passed electronic warfare. And on board a 1.5 million candle power light for finding enemy forces. Of course, using a light like this makes it easier for enemy forces on the ground to find you in the sky. And some are uh, aircraft found out. 
20 millimeter guns fired about 2,500 rounds per minute. The 7.62 millimeter guns either fire 6,000 rounds per minute in a fast setting or 3,000 rounds per minute in a slow setting. So an absolute tremendous amount of firepower. The pilots fired the guns. Here's a 20 millimeter. Here's some hard work. The pilots actually fired the guns, not the gunners. Aviation's weapons and mechanics was their formal title for the gunners. They loaded and maintained the equipment. One mechanic, um, Everett Sprouse, would call the noise. So the gunship was shaking so hard that he believed that any second the aircraft would come apart. The noise and smoke were so intense it would take a couple hours after the mission to clear your brain. Gun barrels would turn red and white from bullets being fired at such high rates. And then reloading the 20 millimeters required using a grill like device weighing between 30 and 40 pounds, and you were most definitely not fire, flying in a straight line. So you really had to be careful you didn't go fly all about the, inside the uh, cabin. So left bank, left bank, right bank, up and down, it's just uh, high risk. I was work. Flying the aircraft in an attack mode was a constant challenge. There were three men coordinating the effort, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer, as well as with input from the navigator. The aircraft uh, commander and pilot were rudder on the ailerons. The firing circle was constantly looking left and you know, with his eyes on the gun sight. So I was flying at night, so there was no visible horizon. Co-pilot flew pitch, which controlled altitude. The AC-119 did not have an independent altitude hold. The flight engineer worked the throttles and monitored the gauges. Three-man effort requiring sense of coordination. This guy is not sitting in some sort of building seat, so he had an empty ammo can for the ride. Two serious issues were vertigo and target fixation for the pilots while they were flying the firing circle. Communications was a constant problem. Airmen used multiple uh, frequencies through ground and other aircraft. There was an internal intercom system, and all this was a deafening din. So there was quite a bit of emphasis on discipline and how you communicated. He brief to the point that it just wasn't time or uh, sound quality for excess chatter. Anti-aircraft fire was always a risk, such as from the Russian-made SA-7. It's a lightweight, shoulder-fired surface-air missile. The illuminator operators kept a lookout if uh, anti-aircraft was fired, uh, spotted, evasive action was needed to be taken quickly. Gunners would need to hang on, the sharp bank returns would be expected. And one of the gunners, one of the guys I met that uh, was an AC-119 gunner, so there was absolute trust between all the crew members. So if the gunner said break, the pilot didn't say, are you sure or are you certain which way, they just did it. So there's trust between the officers flying the plane and listening to the gunner either the gunners or the spotter, so it was a uh, well done job by everybody. There's a bit of gallows humor on board referred to field goals, which is enemy fire going between the tail booms and the horizontal stabilizer. In other words, these planes were wide open, and one guy was telling me they'd fly trail planes delivering Agent Orange to the enemy, so the Agent Orange would get sucked right into the AC-119, so that happened. And that's what a battle damage might look like, this is this airplane made it back to base. Camps were up some heroes on the ground of the war effort. Long shifts, undermanned, and absolutely necessary. The high pace of combat operations, wear and tear on the airframes and engines made for a long work day for maintenance. Maintenance men often flew on the mission serving as gunners and equipment operators. Often had to cut corners in safety because of the high mission tempo and a shortage of trained mechanics. One crew chief named Jesse Lau know that because of time constraints, maintenance such as Jesse Carberry's with the engine running. So Lau would climb out of the cockpit, walk on top of the airplane, over the wing, and over the running engine to get to work. Easily could have been a disaster and a likely court martial we did the stateside, and that wasn't the only safety shortcut that these guys took. I'd like to share some stories, some funny, some tragic, all thought compelling. A few light notes. Gunners might be referred to as puking cannon copters because they often got airsick. Bob Soprano was a crewman aboard an AC-119 flying from the Philippines to Vietnam. The pilot had the co-pilot calculate the maximum takeoff weight to determine how much San Miguel beer could be flown back on the return trip. <laughs> and as, as you can see from the party in the right, it wasn't all work for these guys. 
navigator Frank Emma was assigned to brief units about AC 119s and was flown out to the landing zone. After landing to the pilot notes, Emma got out of the aircraft without putting on his flak jacket. And the pilot says, By the way, just so you know, the last guy that got out of my airplane without a flak jacket on was killed by a sniper. And Frank Emma later wrote, he probably set the all time world speed record for putting a flak jacket on after he got that message from the uh, pilot. <laughs> Most of the time, though, last would be in short supply. 17 AC-119 crewmen were killed in action during the war. The World Run built AC-119 crashed at Thompson Hood in April 1970. Six of eight crewmen died on board. And the two survivors were Major Robert Bokern, who was a navigator, and Sergeant Al Alan Chandler, who was the illuminator operator. Bokern recalled, takeoff was normal, gained about 100 to 150 feet, and then the aircraft loses the right engine. These aircraft were always overloaded, so you were in big, big trouble if on takeoff and losing an engine. Bokern saw the pilot and engineer pushing everything forward on the left engine, feathering the right. Long story short, they crash land about a mile or two past the airport. Bokern takes out his flashlight, sent SOS signals in the direction of a nearby Huey. Huey made a low fast pass as he was on the ground, so it could have been just easily the Via Kong, and came back. Huey hovered a few feet off the ground. Bokram was looking down at the barrel of a 50 caliber machine gun. Now, our guys were taught to identify themselves as American by cussing at each other at night as the bad guys swore poorly in English. So, Bokram cusses up a storm. The gunner on the Huey cusses up a storm. And they're satisfied with each other. The way goes the 50 caliber, and the gunner swings the gun around and pulls Chandler and then Bokram aboard. Later that night, Bokram called a squadron from the hospital. The phone was offered answered by the duty officer, a guy named Jose Cachuela. Cachuela thought he recognized Bokren's voice and immediately and very quietly said, who is this? Bokren identifies himself. Cachuela, in a strange voice, really stretched out the words and said, where are you? Thinking he was getting called either from heaven or hell because he had been told the airplane exploded and everybody died. Alan Chandler was the other surviving airman. He was seriously injured and burned with months of painful recovery time. After he became ambulatory, he was assigned to assist, assist others in the hospital. First person Chandler helped out was an airman who was climbing down a rope to rescue someone. The airman's helicopter was shot down and landed on top of this guy. So Chandler sits by his bed and talked to this man who had burned from something like 97% of his body. He never could respond, and that man didn't make it. That put things in perspective for Chandler. He was alive, although he was not in good shape. His memoir, which you see here, is highly recommended. Chandler recalls, someone always has it worse than you. And no matter how limited your abilities, you can always do something that helps someone else. AC-119 co-pilot Wayne Lessig, known the importance of teamwork, everyone, every single man on board was needed to make the flight a success. He was part of a mission that found rockets being launched towards Da Nang, and Da Nang was generally known as Rocket City for the frequency of being attacked. Lessig quickly called the Da Nang Tower one of rockets, effing rockets, although presumably he spelled it out a little more clarity than that. So the tower crew hits the warning siren and hit the deck. First rocket hits the base of the tower and imploded the windows, and the warning helped avoid casualties. Later that night, Lessig meets these guys and made it clear that Lessig could save their lives. Crew sets up a beer account for Lessig at the NCO club, so he never had to buy a beer again in his name. The tab was called Rockets, Epping Rockets. <laughs> on a sad note, tragedy was never far away in Vietnam, of course. Lessig recalled the loss of Captain Tom Hammond, a pilot in a rocket attack. Hammond had walked towards flight office to prep, prep for a mission, and he was uh, mortally injured by a rocket. Years later, Hammond's daughter, Kirsten, was invited to an AC-119 reunion. She was initially cautious, hesitated to go. She didn't know any of these guys, but she attended. It was a tremendous experience. She had never met her father. So she talked to the people in attendance who knew her dad. They told her about his easygoing attitude, his sense of humor, his common sense, and how his natural leadership made it easy to follow and trust him. She's on the right, and she's now a judge of Hawaii. So an emotional day, obviously, for all concerned. Another memorable flight was in May 1970, commanded by Captain Alan Milicek, call sign was Stinger 21. He and co-pilot Brent O'Brien flew their heavily damaged AC-119 safely back to base. 
It's by anti-aircraft fire, goes to a steep dive. Milichek and O'Brien used all their strength to regain control of the aircraft. The navigator would determine the correct bearings to return home. The aircraft was about 90 minutes from Udor and Thailand and a series of mountain ranges across, including a 9,300-foot high mountain peak. Milichek ordered the crew to toss out everything they could to reduce weight, which was not the gun, so it's just like the old World War II movies, like Memphis Bell. You're in trouble, you have too much weight on board, everything goes out, so the Milichek ordered it to happen. So they nursed the plane back to Udorn. Milichek, who was a religious man, was heard over the intercoms, the aircraft went into the taxiway. Thank you, Lord, thank you. And after leaving the military, he became, among other things, a late minister. After landing, the crew gets out, and they see that 14 feet in the leading edge, and over 17 feet in the trailing edge of the right wing were gone, with the damage to the right outboard aileron and to the fuel tank at the end of the wing. The crew received the McKay Trophy for, 19, for the most meritorious Air Force flight in 1970. Trophies were to be, uh, trophy awards went back to 1912. Previous awardees included Chuck Yeager and General uh, Henry H. Cap Arnold, so it's a pretty distinguished company. In hindsight, they couldn't believe they were able to fly that airplane back. Back the base commander pulled Milichek aside and said, great job flying it, you guys should have bailed out. They made it. The daytime mission, May on May 12, 1972, over South Vietnam, had a call sign Stinger, 19, the Stinger 41. Was flown by Captain Terrence Courtney. His aircraft was stuck in the right wing by the anti aircraft fire. Both right engines began burning, and perhaps mentioned that Kate, uh, AC 119, said four engines, two propeller and then two jet assists to help with the uh, weight of the aircraft. So Courtney uses all his strength to maintain control. When he could no longer control the aircraft, he ordered his crew to bail out, and suddenly got off. Courtney was posthumously awarded an Air Force Cross for sacrificing himself and allowing most of the crew to survive. He had been nominated for a Medal of Honor. Captain David Slayle and Staff Sergeant Kenneth Brown were also killed in the incident. Memories of the three crewmen lost in Singer 41 remain strong. Websites such as the Vietnam Wall of Faces have moving tributes to anyone lost in Vietnam, including Courtney Slayle and Brown. Terry Courtney was born in 1946 from Illinois and left behind his parents and three siblings. One remembrance said, Terry and I trained together and spent our years in Vietnam together. His friendship will always be remembered along with the extraordinary courage that he demonstrated. He is a constant reminder of what great men do for one another during times of war. David Slayle was born in 1945 and raised in Missouri. He was remembered as a real hero, officer, and crewmate. Even what you did for Stinger will never be forgotten. His Mary, and his photo shows him and his wife Barbara, at the time they had a two-year-old daughter. In a 2009 post on these Vietnam sites, Barbara Slagle was looking for Dave's college friends so they could tell their grandkids what type of man Dave Slagle was. Staff Sergeant Brown, born in 1947, is from La Cruces, New Mexico. He served as the illuminator operator, which essentially means, among other tasks, he was a jump master for any bailout. Expectation was he would get off along with the pilots, the last two guys off the airplane. So essentially, Brown sacrificed his life for his crewmates. One friend of his broke, Ken Brown and I were classmates at La Cruces High in 1965, and so recently I knew nothing of Ken's sacrifice. Knowing that his efforts of the year made the enemy pay dearly for messing with our troops makes me feel very proud to have known him. He was married and had two children. On a better note, the Hua Khan Children's Hospital was opened in Denang in 1969. It was financed in part with contributions from U.S. service personnel, including AC-119 Airmen. First year alone, 1,600 kids were admitted, 10,000 were treated on an outpatient basis. So out of all the misery of the war, some brightness. As the U.S. pulled back, we worked on building up the South Vietnamese military. Air Force crews trained their South Vietnamese counterparts to fly AC 119s. These aircraft were turned over to the Vietnamese Air Force. Our men came home, and the AC 119s remained in Vietnam. None of these aircraft made it back in the, to the U.S., and of course, the Republic of Vietnam fell in April 1975 to the Communists. Just some random shots of crewmen, you know, doing their job. Life, of course, moves on, and some here's some remembrances from some of these guys. 
Erwin Greenberg, remember the camaraderie of the crews. Richard Hay dealt with PTSD for years. He and his crew had bailed out over the South China Sea. One man drowned in that incident. They found him peace later. A man named Shelby Lucky said, I went to do the tour again for a million dollars, but the memory were worth more than a million. <laughs> we had two common themes really emerge. One is that the other crew were some of the greatest men they ever knew in their lives. They were their AC-119 crewmates, whether they were officers or enlisted men. And they had 100% trust in all on board to do their jobs and to get home safely. One fellow that I met is named Terry Soroli, who was down in South Bend, Indiana. He was on board an AC-119 immediately preceding Stinger 41, and his aircraft warned Captain Courtney's aircraft about the heavy and close anti-aircraft fire. After landing, the rules crew learned that the Stinger 41 had been shot down. And he said, he told me, he said, he'd never forget that mission. Why wasn't his aircraft shot down that day? Luck? Grace of God? It's an unanswerable question. And some of these airmen, you know, the shadows of Stinger folks, have really turned philosophical in life is the randomness of it all. Of course, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but it doesn't make me think. His so, name is John Rucker. 21-year-old crew chief of the 18th uh, SOS base of Da Nang. He was killed in a rocket attack 11 hours before the ceasefire went into effect on January 27, 1973. He was the last enlisted man killed during the Vietnam War. On John Rucker's page of the Vietnam Wall of Faces, there was a note from a man named Larry Addis that reads, John and I traded ships that day, or it would have possibly been me being that last roll call. Addis that went on to know he felt years ago he came home and uh, Rucker did This commemoration picture with Rucker's family was held earlier this year in recognition of 50th, the 50th anniversary of the war's conclusion. I don't have a picture of her, but John Rucker fathered her child in Vietnam. And years later, she came to the United States and with DNA research, she called up Rucker's mother and the family's reunited. So it's kind of a neat story. I, should, I wish I had included the picture, but uh, it's a good conclusion. So in hindsight, what did these airmen and the ground crews and these aircraft accomplish? On the one hand, they say, well, they put the casualties in the enemy, destruction of war material, like this tank and bridge, uh, tank and bridge structure being destroyed. Post-war analysis conclu concluded that AC-119s were extremely useful weapon systems. Crews overcame equipment limitations with skill and resourcefulness. South Vietnam lasted as long as it did as North, Viet as North Vietnam would never get to full strength in the South until we left. American lives were saved. The story's courtesy of navigator Frank Hammer. This is the guy that uh, hustled up to get his flak jacket on. He was on duty one afternoon when a very large Army Green Beret came into the office. He asked about who flew Shadow 45 the previous night, supporting their unit. Turns out it was Emma, Emma and his crew. Beal gives him a bear hug and his big strong guys that own for a couple of his ribs, it felt like. Tearing the Green Bay, the Green Beret tears up, hands him a note reading, Shadow 45, thanks for saving our lives. Without you guys, we would, would have all been killed. It was signed by six soldiers that survived the firefight and been rescued by helicopter. Emmett received many awards and medals in his career. He said none of them came even close to that scene with the Green Beret. So in conclusion, President Nixon announced the Paris Peace Accords on January 23, 1973, led to our troops coming home, including those saved by the work of AC-119s. This obviously is a Vietnam Wall with over 58,000 American names on it. Some of those names are AC-119 crew, but without their efforts, there would have been many more names on the wall. And these are the 17 AC-119 crewmen uh, killed in action during the war. So that concludes my remarks. Glad to take any questions, and I'd be glad to. Uh, Captain Morgan wants to share anything. That'd be great too. So thanks for your time. Yes, sir. I have a question. I know you've got the model of the plane, but could you just go over quickly what the arms were along the fuselage and? Which ones were controlled by the pilot and then which by the gunners? I don't think the gunners controlled any of them. They were all weapons loaders, the maintenance oh, okay. guys. The, the gunners, that, that's what, all they did. They loaded the guns, they kept them running on, on the airplane. Uh, the pilot had all control of the gun. The, 
the gun sight was on the left side of the uh, left pilot. The left seat pilot was the aircraft commander. Okay. Okay, and these two sensor operators, the FLIR, forward looking infrared radar, this was 1970 that I flew in 71. It was one of the most advanced systems. You could, it detected heat. It didn't see people, but it detected heat. Truck engines, campfires, and where we flew, there was no good guys. Everything was free fire. Right. You never had to get permission from anybody. Never had to ask them. So did the guns themselves focus on the heat, or did? Well, the guns were set. Every mission could change. The guns were set at a certain, had to be set at a certain altitude where you were flying. Every gun had to be adjusted, all six guns, for that altitude. If you were flying 5,000 feet above the ground, which was the highest we ever flew, or anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 feet, depending on the mission we were sent for. And the guns had to be reset. You had to fly in a perfect 30 degree angle of bank and at a constant airspeed. Okay. And, and once all that happens, theoretically, you could drop a, a rope out the side of that airplane and a guy in the ground could hold that rope and walk right around. That's the premise of a gunship. Constant angle of bank at a certain airspeed at a certain elevation and you could hit pinpoint. Were those six guns all these mini guns or? No, no. <clears throat> the two outboard, if you take a look at this, the two outboard guns were 20 millimeter Vulcan okay. cannons. This is a shell from that. Yeah. You can pass that around if you like. Is that, that a 20 or yes, a That's the 20 millimeter. Who's the shell, sir? These are the 7.62, the 30 caliber. Okay. 30 caliber shell. Those are both small. <laughs> those, yeah. The, those we never shot. Very seldom shot those. Mm -hmm. In all my missions, and I had 180 combat missions, probably we used those only if it was troops in contact. Mm -hmm. If we got a call when we were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail looking for trucks, and troops wow. were being overrun at night, they'd, they'd call us. The command and control center was a big seat. C-124 airplane flying 24 hours a day above us. So he would contact us and give us a coordinate and said, please help Moonbeam or somebody and they'd give us the coordinates and we'd fly in and we'd use the miniguns. I have a question on that 20 millimeter. Was it just a projectile or did it explode when it hit something? The two ammunitions we used for the 20 were armor-piercing incendiary or explosive incendiary. Both of them could damage or kill a truck or a train or a tank. Two types of ammunition, depending on what, where we were asked to fly. And how they determined that, that they had many sensors that were dropped from different airplanes around the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And those sensors were broadcasting troop movements, uh, convoys, and so every night when we went out, they'd say, okay, here's your, your coordinates. We detected the movement of trucks going down this last night. And so they push us into that area. The problem was every time you push, it pushed your told which area that when you arrived there and started finding a target or two, they all had anti-aircraft gun aimed at us because it was kind of a joke that if you weren't getting shot at, you were in the wrong place. <laughs> okay. Because they didn't protect places that you were that they didn't. So right, right. You always knew, and there were certain areas. There was one place called Bam Bam. That was uh, a Lima site for the, their, the bad guys that we always get shot at. I mean, 
it wasn't unusual to get shot at 200 times a night. And the, two, the gunners, or the I.O., uh, illuminated operator, they would lay flat out when we were in the target area. One on the left side and one on the right side, laying flat on the floor of the airplane. They were miked, hot mic, and to, to talk to the uh, uh, group. And they'd lay flat out, and when they saw AAA coming, they'd say, break right, break right, break left, break left. And if they say, break right, break right, break right, right, you knew if they were coming right at you. Because the tracers they shot at you were kind of spaced apart. But if you could only see one line of tracers, that was exciting the, the, the guys looking down. And they would just, their voices would change about two on the thing <laughs> for that. So we just jinked the airplane and put it up on its side, which the 119 wasn't really designed for. Uh, and hopefully it missed you. And it usually did. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, the, he said they flew from the Philippines. Did they all fly from the Philippines? Oh, no. That, that oh, was that just was. like where we fed. They were bases in Vietnam. Yeah. They were ferry oh. flights. They ferried the airplanes probably as a stop to fill up with gas. And then once they got into Vietnam, they stayed there. Oh, I think the long range bombers. Did they fly from the Philippines to Vietnam? They didn't. The B 52s. Huh? You're saying the B 52s? Yeah, the big bombers, yeah. Yeah, they were Guam, Okinawa, and Thailand. Oh. I don't think they, they were, I don't think they staged out of the Philippines to my knowledge. Oh, I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah. I, were, I know it was out of the country. But it was a uh, very exciting mission. There's some pictures here that are similar to uh, what Perry showed. And uh, the, the crew was a 10 man crew on the AC 119K model. 10 men including the pilot. Mm -hmm. And the pilot, I was a captain, a young captain, uh, and everybody reported to me on that airplane. And I, of all the missions I've flown, I, I've never had a problem with anybody not doing exactly what they were supposed to do. It was the most harmonious crew, and everybody was how many Six. missions did you have all together? 180. What? 180 missions? Yes. Wow. Over how many years? <laughs> One year? One year? 11 and a half months. That's like every day. Oh, about every other day. Sometimes, yeah, it, you know, you couldn't get up with when the monsoons were, were in the area we didn't fly, so. Oh. Yeah. But 180 missions. Each mission lasted between three and four hours. I was in station in, in, at a little base called the Khan Phanam, NKP. It's, it's not a household word. Uh, it was in northeastern Thailand, and it's right on the Mekong River. And once we took off, we were over the river into Laos. And about 90, Probably 90% of my missions was on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the other 10%, we were diverted for our troops in contact missions to, to help somebody else. I imagine your plane was hit several times by. Not, not by directly. We, we, sometimes if there was putting up flak, we okay. could, it would ping along the side of the airplane, but I was never hit directly. Yeah, never hit directly. Wait, mainly because of the sensor guys, the guys that laid on their stomach outside. Because the gunners had nothing else to do when we were shooting. In the sequence of, of finding a target and shooting involved the FLIR operator, who had a little black and white camera in the airplane, and that little ball turn. He, he had a joystick, and he just moved that ball turn around as we were working on the whole paralleling the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And he'd say, if, and then the other sensor operator looked up the left side of the airplane with the night observation scope, um, which wasn't really too effective. 
the flare was where we found most of the target, the heat, mm -hmm. the heat. And, and when you're flying along there, and uh, if you, the flare out here, say, take flare guidance, and he'd push a button on the, on the computer, and in my left here, while I'm flying the airplane, the, the gun sight was right here, and it's about, the screen is about this big, and it's floor mounted, and it's kind of tilted a little bit so I could look at it. And, it, and what that did, it put a pipper, moving pipper, hmm. on that screen. And there's all, there was a fixed pipper with a, like a bullseye. Well. And the job was that we, the co pilot, would, would handle the altitude and the bank, make sure we're at the right altitude in the bank right away. We set that up before we even got into that area because we knew what the elevations were. And the, I can't remember if the flight engineer, you said the flight engineer did the throttles, but I thought the co pilot might have done it. But oh, it could have been handled with this. Each person's background, how the aircraft commander wanted to run, I'm sure there's a variety. So when, when he'd say, take FLIR guidance, that pipper would come up and start moving in my gun sight. And my job was a little bit of rudder or a little bit, tiny bit of bank, maybe a, a degree or two to try to line that little thing that's running around in that gun sight that the FLIR was holding. Um, and once the two that lined up with fixed, I pushed a little red button, that's all it was, and I hit shot the guns. And before we did that, I would say, put number one can Vulcan on, or put number six Vulcan on. The two Vulcan cannons with that there were on the outside, and that's all we used. When we were what was the trucks. rate of fire on those guns? 30, I, I think you said 25, okay. I thought there were 3,000 rounds a minute. A lot. One speed, one speed, they only had one speed. The little guns, you could shoot at 6,000 rounds a minute, each one. That's pretty fast. Yeah, so the gun loaders had plenty to do because you'd have to exhaust that ammo pretty, pretty so long, quickly. Before we got, in, once we got in the target area and they found a target for the for us, uh, the FLIR or the NAS, they had a little red on the center console, a little flip switch, and I'd tell the flight engineer, gun's hot, and he'd take that switch and turn it over and push, push it hot. And then I'd tell the gunners, give me number one or number six, or if we were using the mini guns, I'd say, put on two of the mini guns, I don't care which one, because they're all in the same place. So only one time of all the missions I've flown where I, I put all six guns on. I don't know anybody else that's done this, but we were in a troops in contact situation, and they were Laotian troops that I, we had diverted from our hunting mission to help them. And it, uh, it was just getting to be daylight, which we can't fly in the daylight. You mentioned a comment about the one uh, Stinger 41. Stinger 41 that was shot down was a daylight mission. They were trying that because I never it, it was unheard of because it, we're, we were slow and low. We flew about 120 knots, 130 knots in an orbit, and so we did it at night. The only, they might hear us, but they couldn't see us. But that, that one mission, they tried to move that into a daylight operation. And it just... Yeah, I think it was a North Vietnamese offensive, and we were scrambling to help out the South Vietnamese, but I think that was the last AC-119 daylight mission after the Fort James Crew got shot down. Yeah. That was it. And then, yeah, that was, that was a tough one. That, that one gentleman, Malachek, mm -hmm. that airplane, if you look at the history of that, and I've read that history a couple times about how we got home, it took he and the co-pilot full left rudder and full aileron deflection to make the airplane go straight. Mm -hmm. 
He didn't know at the time, because it was nighttime, how bad it was. But there was fire coming out from, from the fuel system on, on the other side of the airplane. And when they got down, it was 13 feet into the wing. Um, and that's how they landed. This guy landed that airplane after it, well, most of the crew bailed out and they jettisoned everything. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. Truly amazing. That, that was how they flew for about almost an hour. Full left, <laughs> full left aileron to go straight. Jeez. The other thing that, that, that's interesting that maybe you uh, Barry didn't touch on is if you were ever diverted to work at troops in contact, and it was it was critical that. To just identify the good guys and the bad guys, obviously. Yeah. That was very critical. And most of the time, what we did, they had mortar tubes, the good guys, and they dropped a flashlight in the mortar tube. And it would, and it, it would not alert the bad guys that the lights were on, because we could see it from up above. So they had offsets, the, the flare operator would fix on that flashlight thing, and then the person on the ground who was communicating with me and the rest of the, the navigator, he would say, 100 meters north, take, shoot 100 meters north of my position. Mm -hmm. When they said anything 100 meters or less, they, we had to get them to accept responsibility for a short round, because the guns are pretty accurate. But sometimes you hit a, a, a little buffet, and so anytime we were told to do that, we would say, will you accept responsibility? And usually the guy would scream, hell yes, shoot, shoot. <laughs> and, and sometimes they wanted it right on their position, because they said, we're bunkered in, shoot. And that, that, was, that was when you're Everybody was at their best, uh, tedious and, and working hard, making sure that we didn't get a short. That was every pilot's worst nightmare. Shooting your own, shooting your own people. Any questions I can help you with? It was a uh, the airplane. I never, we never had. I never had to, I had one mission to abort because of maintenance, mm -hmm. only one. And that was with the uh, propeller system. The propeller, the AC, or the C-119, had 3350 in, uh, engines, third, that's what they call them, our 3350s. And if the, when you pre-flight the airplane, if it was dripping more than six drops a minute of, of oil, it was grounds for rejection. Uh, and that was the only time. But takeoff and land takeoff, the airplane was originally designed, as it was shown, for 64,000 pound gross weight when it was first made. That was with the two resets, one on each side, 3,300 horsepower each. And then we flew it at 80,000 pounds. And the temperature was. 85, 90 degrees even at night. So it, airplanes don't fly real good when it's hot and muggy. So every time you took off, we had we had the jets running full speed. The only way they were they, that airplane could get off the ground was when they started adding the, the yelp, a jet the engine jet on side. each side yeah. of the reset. So it went from a two-engine designed airplane to a four-engine. Two propellers and two, and two and two jets. And the little jets had two little toggle switches, one for each engine. Up was run, down was idle. And that's so the jets were main or only used for takeoff. They were at full at full takeoff. Once we got up in the air, we'd bring them back to idle. Uh, once we were in target area. They were, they were 
were usually at, at night, but they were always running. We never shut them off. They were always just at night if we needed them. Yes, sir. What if the loaders in the back not go death and all the gunfire in the mortar bomb go off? I'm telling you. All the, the noise in the back, the guys loading up the guns, how did they oh, yeah. go death? Oh, well, when those, that one picture where they showed the two crew members with headsets, we never, we never used a headset. We had helmets, really nice helmets that were pretty well soundproof. Really? Yeah, it was like a football helmet with earmuffs in it. But, but they were electrically operated, so anytime you had a communication, you wanted to talk to anybody in the airplane, you, you could, they could hear you perfectly. But the crew up in front, did they hear the guns and all that going off? Did you hear all the guns going off being in the front? Uh, not really. I mean, I mean, I. Well, did they have like a wall there? You know, like yeah, a little bit. A little bit. And the airplane was real. There wasn't any doors on here. Everything was wide open. Really? Wow, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, the illuminator. Colors. And the illuminator operator, his, 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 there wasn't any door there at all. So the doors were open, and we didn't have doors. Was the guy strapped in? Yeah. So he didn't fall off the door? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that illuminator, it was a good idea at the time. But the problem with that illuminator is when you turned it on at night, guess who could see you? Gave your location away. Yeah. I think I used it once. Once oh. in, in 180 missions. It was, and it, it was also a flare launcher. And I think that's the only time I used it. Is we dropped flares for some guy that was getting troops in contact. We dropped flares. He'd say, I need some illumination, and we wouldn't turn that light on. We just drop flares. And they had there was a flare launcher and an illuminator combined. Wow. But the airplane was a good airplane. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you guys for coming. Much appreciated. Hope you got something out. Thank you. Yeah. And it was a okay. remarkable cruise and a remarkable airplane. And it's not that well known in the stores I like talking about. And, and as, as you mentioned, the, the syner synergy of, of these 10 people was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Five officers and five enlisted men. And the crews were fixed. Usually, you know, I had one crew. I was Stinger 19, or Stinger 19. And I mean, you'd do anything for these guys. Anything. Not and they do anything for me. Just a, a great bunch of great bunch of guys. Help yourself to look yeah. at these and I'll stick around for a while. Get any questions? Okay.